Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhupada. All glory to the Prabhupada. Uh, Hare Krishna to all of you who have joined on this wonderful session uh, to be taken on a journey of Vedic cosmology to the spiritual worlds, to know about all the worlds. And many times we think uh, the, the universe that we are in is called the magic planet. They say magic planet, but the real, what is the real magic planet? Maharaj, of course, is living in one such dam, Sridham Mayapur. And Maharaj is going to be taking us through a journey of understanding Vedic cosmology. I have, uh, you know, what better person than Maharaj to guide us through and all the way from Sridha Mayapur. Thank you very, very much, Maharaj, for being here with us today. Looking forward, there are many devotees who have joined up and I'm sure even as the class progresses, we will have recording and many more will still join us on the session of Vedic cosmology. Thank you very, very much, Maharaj, for being here with us. And thanks to all the students for joining us today. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, welcome devotees for the 24th unit of Bhakti Ve Bhakti Vaibhava Module 2, uh, which talks about Vedic cosmology. Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, chapter 26 to uh, 16 to 26. Uh, we have with us His Holiness Bhakti Vignavinasha Maharaj to teach this wonderful session with us. Maharaj, as I informed, uh, we have totally 18 students who are doing this Bhakti White Baba. And apart from that, many devotees are joined and uh, basically they will be listening to the classes, Maharaj. Only the, uh, uh, the students who are doing it, they will be interacting with you. So over to you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, thank you very much. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishe Shashunyavari Paschachati Shatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Payevacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so very glad to have the opportunity to present some of Srimad Bhagavatam to the devotees here. So we're beginning tonight, that we'll meet three times a week, right? Thursday. This meeting is being recorded. We'll meet Thursday and then Sunday and Tuesday. Right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, let me begin sharing the screen. Okay, I've got the, the text here. I want to show the text to everyone. Um, this is... Go back to... So we're beginning, I was told, beginning from chapter 15. Have, have you already covered chapter 15? I was told to begin from chapter 15. The unit actually begins from chapter 15. Uh, 
the glories of the descendants of King Priyavrata. Maharaj, I think we have covered that. One minute, Maharaj. Ah, yes, Maharaj. We have to start with uh, chapter 15. Thank you. Yeah. That's a relief. <laughs> Okay, uh, because I prepared this chapter. All right, so chapter 15 begins with, well, it's the glories of the descendants of King Priyavrata. What's the connection? We were hearing before, previously, of course that was some time back, because you, this, is, this section of the Bhagavatam has been left aside, and you went on to the sixth canto. Are you hear, Are you hearing okay? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So this section was left aside, and so we have to remember uh, the previous section was on, on this canto was dealing with Bharat Maharaj. And you heard about Bharat Maharaj. And so this is going on continuing with the son of Bharat Maharaj, who is mentioned here. All right? The son of Bharat Maharaj is a great personality named Sumati. So, first text. There's only a few verses in, the, in this chapter, there's only some six, 16 slokas, and it's all prose. Anyway, we'll just go through it, uh, just to take out the main points, the points which are of interest to us. Uh, so, chapter describes, the son of Bharat Maharaj, Sumati, followed the path of Rishavdev. But in the age of Kali, some unscrupulous people will imagine him to be Lord Buddha himself. Th these people, who will actually be atheistic and of bad character, will interpret the Vedic principles in an imaginary, infamous way to support their activities. Thus these sinful people will accept Sumati as Lord Buddha Dev and propagate the theory that everyone should follow the principles of Sumati. In this way they will be carried away by mental concoction. All right, so this is the uh, opening verse in this 15th chapter, hearing about the son of Bharat Maharaj and how people were misunderstanding his teaching. So then Prabhupada brings up, in his purport, Prabhupada brings up about a community which is a little bit known in India. Maybe in the times of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, they were more active, more prominent, known as Arya Samaj. And he talks about how the, these people are not actually Aryans, that they say they are the real Aryans. But they're not Aryans at all, because they don't, they don't understand the real purpose of the Vedas. They don't take it, the Vedic teachings, through the parampara. They give their own, they have their own interpretation of the Vedic teachings. And then Prabhupada brings up other people also. He talks about Buddhists and then the Jains also. Uh, the Buddhists, for example, they don't follow the Vedas. They, have, they don't accept any Vedic teachings. So just recently, actually, just on the, uh, the day after Lord Nisringadev's appearance, they celebrated Buddha Jayanti. But we don't celebrate Buddha Jayanti. We don't worship Lord Buddha. We don't observe that. But he's one of the avatars. He's Das Avatar. Why don't we don't follow him? Sometimes people question, they want to know why we're not following, but when he's one of the avatars, the reason is the Acharyas say, because he rejected the Vedas. 
Although he's the Lord himself, he chose to reject the Vedas. And in this purport, Prabhupada discusses why he did that. He, Lord Buddha, of course, he has good reasons. Lord Buddha was associating with atheists because at the time of the appearance of Lord Buddha, India had become like a slaughterhouse. Every, every marketplace, every village was a, a slaughterhouse in the names of Vedic culture. There was wholesale slaughter of animals going on and it was being encouraged by the Brahminical class. So Lord Buddha came as a, he was like a, a reaction against the social system at that time. So the people who followed Lord Buddha were atheists. So Lord Buddha didn't teach about God because they didn't believe in God, they didn't want God. We have the same problem today, preaching in atheistic countries of the world. Of course, atheism is everywhere today, all over the world. But there are some countries where governments themselves propagate atheism. It's the official policy of the country that they should be atheists. So Lord Buddha was preaching to atheists, he was associating with atheists. He didn't, he didn't speak about atheism. He just taught them, follow me. And by following him, then they got perfection, they got some perfection. Where, where they actually went to, what was their destination, I, I'm not sure, I wouldn't know. <laughs> some people say the best, the highest destination the Buddhists can get, they can go to the, go to the spirit, go to the, the junction between the material and spiritual world, they'll take a bath there, and then come back in the material world. But they're not, going to, they're not going to enter the spiritual world because they don't believe in God. They don't believe in... The, their understanding of spirit is that spirit is matter. And so they say spirit can also be destroyed. But Lord Buddha didn't teach about that. So Buddha says, the anatma, the Buddhist philosophy is anatma, no soul, because nothing spiritual. Anyway, three Vedic culture, three cultures against the Vedic culture, the Jains, the Buddhists, Arya Samajis. Right? So, Aryans discussed in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna tells Arjuna that you're, you're not acting like an Aryan because you're not doing your duty. You're not performing your duty. The Aryans are Vedic. And in the purport, Prabhupada writes also, one who does not know the greatness of Lord Krishna cannot be accepted as an Aryan. So Prabhupada is very specific here, what he, what he expects someone to be an Aryan. You have to know the greatness of Lord Krishna. So this, I thought that was a very interesting point which Prabhupada makes. All right, so this was the, the first son of uh, Bharat Maharaj. He was uh, mentioned like this. And then we go on and we hear about another one of the descendants of Priyavrata named Pratiha. And it's described here, text number four, that King Pratiha personally propagated the principles of self-realization. In this way, not only was he purified, but he became a great devotee of the Supreme Person, Lord Vishnu, and directly realized him. So Prabhupada picks up on this in his purport and he talks about the actual qualification for preaching Krishna consciousness. Right? 
He says, a real preacher cannot be bogus. He must first of all realize Lord Vishnu as he is. And then Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita. Upadeshanti te jnanam jnaninas tattva darshanaha. Right? Tattva darshi. He should be a tattva darshi. He should have seen the truth. All right, Prabhupada writes in the purport, such a person can become a guru and propound Vaishnava philosophy all over the world. The paragon of bona fide preachers and gurus is King Pratiha. The paragon, the perfect example of a bona fide preacher. So, what is the, the, the main point here? As stated in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna in that verse 434, he not only describes the qualification of the, the person approaching the spiritual ma master and the method of approaching the spiritual master, but he also describes the qualification of the spiritual master, that the spiritual teacher has to be a tattvadarshi. He has to have seen the truth. Not only should he have seen it, but he should be able to reveal it to others. You get some people, they say, well, I know the truth, I just can't explain it in words. I can't explain it to you. You know, that's, that's cheating. That's bogus. If someone says like that, that they say, oh, I know the truth, I've realized the truth, I just can't show you, then that's not Tattvadarshi. The Tattvadarshi, not only has he seen the truth, but he can show others also how to see the truth. So this is what Prabhupada's bringing out here, and this is uh, significant. This Pratiha, this King Pratiha, he taught, propagated the principles of self-realization. So this way he was purified. When we, when we, by preaching, the more we give Krishna consciousness, the more we get Krishna consciousness. The more you give the mercy, the more you get. So Pratiha realized the Supreme Lord. And then we hear about many other great souls and we come up to text number seven and we're going to hear about very very great personality Maharaj Gaya all right King Gaya text number seven all right and there are many wonderful qualities listed here for Maharaj Gaya so I thought you could take a few minutes yourself and just go through this verse and write down which particular qualities of Maharaj Gaya you feel would be most helpful to a leader in the present day society. Maybe you could even say in our Krishna conscious society, someone is a leader in the Krishna consciousness movement. Do you think any of Maharaj Gaya's qualities would be particularly helpful today to a leader? So text number seven has a number of qualities. Read through it. Pick out one quality which you feel is particularly important for a devotee today who is in a leadership role. And there's an, there are more qualities. If you go on to text 9, 10, 11, 12, and you'll see there's more qualities there also. Anyway, read through text number 7. Let's deal with text number 7 first. Please just read it to yourselves, and we'll give you a few minutes to reflect on it, and tell me which particular quality do you feel is most relevant to devotees today.
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, I see the four uh, things that is mentioned. And in that, the first one, sense gratification uh, is a useless and waste of time. So the, the preacher of the uh, Krishna consciousness movement should understand this. So this is the one point I can mention. Sanskrit, this is one of the qualities mentioned here in text number seven. Yes, seven. Sense gratification is a waste of time. So that uh, preacher should know. Okay. Thank you for your. Uh, Bhakti Rakshak Prabhu, uh, the discussion is mainly meant for the Bhakti Vaibhav students. So you are allowed to just listen to the class, okay? Yeah. Uh, Maharaj, there are wonderful qualities. Uh, one of the quality here, Maharaj, is called as Upalalana. Yes. Which means uh, he would sometimes call meeting and satisfy the citizens with a sweet word. Okay. Uh, this is one co good quality of a leader where he will uh, involve everybody and uh, he will uh, have a meeting with them and he'll make them a part of his team and there he encourages the devotees to progress. This is one quality which uh, uh, I like. Along with, there are so many other. This one is uh, I, I like much. Yes, I think it's also an important one. I would agree it's a very important We We used to call that Istagosti. When, when I was a new devotee, we used to meet regularly. The temple president used to gather all the devotees together and we'd have a meeting and it was called Istagosti. And Prabhupada taught the devotees that we should do like that. <coughs> Prabhupada taught devotees that we should do like that, that we should come together and discuss together Krishna consciousness any difficulties we were having, any issues or any problem, or simply discuss the Krishna conscious philosophy. So it's very important, thank you Prabhu, to come together, to meet together. So leaders, they should be willing to come and meet with the devotees and know the devotees and talk with them. Thank you. Someone else? Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes, Hare Krishna, yes, Nandar Pada Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj, the, one of the qualities which I wanted to point out here, he, though he was a king, you know, he gave his citizens all the facilities and as a householder, he executed all his duties so that at the end he becomes a strict devotee. Uh, this is the very big uh, challenge and uh, a practice which uh, I feel we have to imbibe it, uh, being grastas, how uh, when we take up Krishna consciousness, uh, then the first thing that we have to is for how to make our children Krishna conscious or as husband or as wife and then how the same Krishna consciousness to be extended to the family and then to the society and then on the largest. Okay. Would you, would you like to tell us what you have to do to be a strict devotee? Uh, yes, Maharaj, I would try my best. Uh, Maharaj, the very first thing is uh, how we have to follow the rules and regulations. Then our uh, sadhana, uh, chanting of the rounds. There will be challenges. Uh, we have children, uh, we are abroad. Uh, so we feel, oh, nobody is uh, looking at us. Nobody is there, you know, to keep a watch on us. We are free to do anything. But we need to understand we have given this promise to our Guru Maharaj that I'll be strictly following four regulatory principles. I'll be chanting my rounds very nicely. So, uh, as we see uh, King Gaya, so we understand from the scriptures that we have examples how we have to follow. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, Benvat Prana. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I would just, uh, the point uh, I would like to mention is Guru Maharaj that he was not proud and also he was always jubilant. 
many times it's very inspiring to see if our leaders are always having a smiling face and they're jubilant and uh, at the same time not proud we feel they are more approachable to us ah. and, and in that way it's really inspiring that we can reveal our hearts Okay. and if 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 we are not always talking oh no that's going wrong and this is going wrong but rather someone you know they always smiling and seeing how to correct things then just uh, you know making a list of the problems then this way it's very inspiring going on and yeah thank you very much that's a very nice point i appreciate this yeah yeah alakshna maharaj yes alakshna maharaj uh maharaj the translation the very first sentence maharaj i uh, you know the king king guy gave full protection and security security to the citizens so that their personal property would not uh, be disturbed by undesirable elements and also he ensure that sufficient food to feed all the citizens uh, the poshana uh, this is the characteristics which you know i i would like to uh, pick it up uh, because this is the current scenario maharaj the corona the situation which has, which has uh, devastated the entire world so here the uh the real characteristics will come into play uh you know uh, so he will ensure uh, the you know uh, the 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 the, uh, the uh, specific countries uh, the government who is managing and you know uh, so uh, they should ensure that you know the uh, the, the people are not uh, uh, get you know more burdened with uh, this kind of scenario and then they will, they, will, they will take care of them So this I I just want to. Okay, it's very relevant at this time, Prabhu. Yes, definitely. Yes. You brought up a very relevant point. At this time, we see a lot of need for food distribution, and and we see actually our devotees quite actively participating in this, particularly in the underdeveloped countries where there's really serious economic crisis, like. there are some countries like thailand which is basically a tourist country the their economy is based on tourism but the, now of course for the last year or more there's no tourism so there's no industry is no business at all so people have very difficult time and when there's lockdown then everything stops and construction stops and the workers who are doing construction they all have to go and we i think also in the gulf there was a lot of people who had to come back to india and although they had work there in the middle east they would come back to to india and so yes having food and and security is very very important and within our own krishna consciousness movement also is a very serious issue devotees they have to be i remember in in the beginning of our movement sometimes we didn't have much food <laughs> and sometimes you know devotees would complain you know we're not getting enough prasadam you have to have better prasadam we were practically living sometimes just by begging boga and wasn't very uh it it was very very simple it was very purifying because we were really depending on krishna but some devotees they didn't like it and they felt you know there should be better arrangement of course nowadays the movement has, doesn't have these problems but in the beginning of our movement was a problem just to provide sufficient prasadam for the devotees so the, the leaders the king his job is to make sure and, and if there's a famine if there's a drought then it's a serious problem the governments they have to be ready to open their storage and to distribute food and provide for the people that's the duty of the leaders to take care of others to be to give shelter and that means giving food very basic requirement to, security also to be able to protect them just like from disease and from things like this covid virus people want protection and countries some countries are poorer they can't afford the vaccine some of the people who are selling the vaccine you know as i saw recently the new billionaires I think there's a, a number of new billionaires and they're all owners of these uh, vaccine companies manufacturing vaccines they're making billions of dollars 
But the poorer countries, they can't afford to buy the vaccine. The people there don't have money for vaccine. So these are problems. The leaders, they have to be concerned with these kind of things. So Maharaj Gaya, as an ideal leader, that was mentioned first. First of all, Sukadeva Goswami mentions that here in his uh, description of Maharaj Gaya, that he gave full protection and security to the citizens. So very important. That's what people really want. That if you if you don't have that, then every what what good is anything else? If you don't have proper food and security, then what good are all the other things? Okay. Yes. Anybody else? Hare Krishna. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaja Gaya, as a, a devotee, he was always ready to give respect to other devotees and to engage in the devotion service of the Lord. Yes. So, yeah. if we, like, uh, even uh, in many ISKCON temples already, yeah, in all ISKCON temples, it is uh, uh, going on. And uh, same thing is applied to the society to and to the leaders, all the leaders, administrators, and uh, all the political systems. Then uh, what kind of uh, problems are there? Everything will be can be solved easily with all the leaders when they are respecting each other and uh, when they are uh, coming to Krishna conscious and follow the religious principles and do the bhakti, yes, then all the miseries can be nullified. Yes, thank you. Yes, it's important that devotees have to come together and work together and offer respects to each other. And just like Srila Prabhupada organized the Mayapur annual meeting, the GBC leaders would come every year and they would discuss how to create unity out of diversity. Because Srila Prabhupada was certainly aware that in a worldwide movement like Krishna consciousness, there's a lot of diversity. Because devotees are preaching in many different cultures and different kinds of people, all different races are coming to Krishna consciousness. But we need to have that unity. So it's very important that we're able to give respect to other devotees and to come together and be willing to share, to help each other. Okay, so we'll go ahead here. Just some points here. In the purport, Prabhupada talks about the position of the king. Because we know in the Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 10, how is the king described? Representative of Krishna. Yes. In Bhagavad Gita, chapter 10, Lord Krishna says, Among men, I am the monarch. Right? Krishna is not just any man. <laughs> He's the monarch. He's the king. So, the king is a representative of God. And he's described here as Naradev, that is, the Lord as a human being. And so, it, it's a very big position to take. He's worshipped as God on the material platform. That's a Vedic, that's a Vedic culture. And we, we see this in, still in some countries, they still have the, the custom to give some respect. Although the king doesn't have any power anymore, he's still given some respect as a representative of God. In England, for example, they have a queen. Recently her husband died, but the, the queen is still there. She's in her 90s now, and she's very, very... Uh, saintly lady and what they had they, they they have a thing called the national anthem and they say god save our king god, or god save our queen <laughs> like that they pray like that this is a prayer and i remember one time i remember some time back in the uk there was a uh, the, the queen went to visit one of the universities and some of the students there 
were very rebellious and anti-society. Anti and they did a thing protesting that we don't want the queen, out with the queen, you know, we don't need this queen. And it, it was it, a very controversial thing that after this incident, there was some talk that they, that they were thinking to close down the university because it was, it was such a, an offensive thing to do, to protest against the position of the Queen. So the, uh, the students who had organized it, they were put out of the university. They were not allowed to study anymore. They were banned from studying. And the uni they were even thinking to close down the university because it was such a bad thing. And so the, the queen is give the qu king or the queen, they're given a lot of respect. But Prabhupada brings up, he explains how in the Kali Yuga, practically the, the kings and the queens, they're also influenced by the Kali Yuga. And Prabhupada quotes from Ramayana, that Vibhushan, Vibhushan, the brother of Ravan, he made friendship with Lord Ramachandra and he told Lord Ramachandra that if I ever go against the, if I ever go against the rule or the, the if I go against your friendship, if I do anything to offend you, then I, I, I will take birth in the Kali Yuga as a king or as a brahmana. So taking birth in the Kali Yuga as a king or a brahmana is like a punishment because there are no real kings and there are no real brahmanas in the Kali Yuga, right? As the, 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 the kings are pretty much fallen, they, they're, not, they're not godly. Readily, any very readily, you know, they, they have no real culture. They have no Vedic culture, certainly. And the Brahmanas, Brahmanas in name only, Kalo, Sudra, Sambhava. In the Kali Yuga, people are all Sudras by birth. So this is explained here in some detail by Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, due to this, the whole world is in a chaotic condition and is always in distress. Why is it in such a chaotic condition? Because there is no brahmanas to give good guidance and there are no kings to protect and show the good example. So the world is in distress. Then Prabhupada said, compared to the present standards, Maharaj Gaya was a true representative of Lord Vishnu. Therefore he was known as Mahapurush. And Prabhupada continues this point in the purport of the next verse and he talks about how the present time there should be leaders like Maharaj Gaya, King Yudhisthira, King Prithu. And then the citizens will be happy. <laughs> will they? Well, we hope so. We need something to make people happy. Nanda Kishore Prabhu was saying that, that uh, Maharaj Gaya was always jubilant. And so if we see somebody jubilant, if we see somebody happy, it makes us happy. It's contagious. We are affected by others. If we see other people happy and joyful, we'll also become joyful. That is very important. He was saying if we see Maharaj Gaya is always jubilant. If you see people, we see leaders happy, but if you see them all in anxiety, oh worried, oh maybe I'm going to get COVID, oh maybe we're all going to die, oh we're so worried, then it's a, you feel depressed also. But if you see people happy, singing and dancing, just like Sankirtan, Sankirtan, devotees go everywhere singing and dancing, chanting. 
waving hands to people, waving to them and shaking hands with them sometimes, and, and just showing people to be happy because people in Kali Yuga are so miserable, they're so unfortunate, they never get any real happiness. So it's important for us to show the mood, to be happy. And being a leader doesn't mean you have to be a king, doesn't mean you have to have a big position. You can be a leader and, and just be an ord in an ordinary role, insignificant role, but at the same time you can be a leader. Leader is not a position. Leader is a state of mind, it's a behavior. It's showing the right example, good qualities. So we don't need managers. We don't like that. People don't like the term manager. But leaders, leadership, that's really good. That's important. And servant leaders. In Krishna consciousness, we talk about being servant leaders, leading the people by the mood of servant. Okay, text number nine. King Gaya performed all kinds of Vedic rituals. He was highly intelligent, expert in studying all the Vedic literatures. He maintained religious principles and possessed all kinds of opulence. He was a leader among gentlemen and a servant of the devotees. Oh, that's a wonderful quality, to serve the devotees. He was a totally qualified plenary expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, who could equal him in the performance of ritualistic ceremonies? So he's an expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yeah, we're all somewhat expansions of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We're not, person, we're not uh, personal expansions, but we're vibhinamsas, tiny expansions of the Lord. There's the vibhu and the vibhinamsas. And then some more qualities are mentioned. Text number 10, the chaste and honest daughters of Maharaj Daksha were always they, they bathed Maharaj Gaya with san sanctified waters and they were very satisfied with him. So the Maharaj Gaya had this wonderful ability that he could satisfy everyone. Even the, the daughters of Daksha were impressed with him and they bathed him with sanctified water. Then the planet Earth came as a cow. And as though she saw a calf, she delivered milk when she saw all the good qualities of Maharaj Gaya. In other words, Maharaj Gaya was able to derive all benefits from the earth and thus satisfy the desires of the citizens. However, he personally had no desire. So this is a nice quality also for a leader. He had no desire, no material desire. But he tries to satisfy the desires of others. As a king, as a leader, he has that responsibility to keep people satisfied, to fulfill their desires. Of course, we see leaders today, politicians, they will come and they will promise people so many things trying to satisfy their desires. <laughs> it's, it's all lying and cheating, politics and diplomacy. Going ahead, text number 11, King Gaya had no personal desire for sense gratification. That was mentioned earlier by one of our devotees. All of his desires were fulfilled by virtue of his performance of Vedic ritual. So Prabhupada describes like this how Maharaj Gaya could satisfy people. Uh, for example, for the brahmanas, he would satisfy them 
by giving charity. And for the Kshatriyas, for the kings, he would satisfy them by fighting with them in battle. Then they would feel satisfied when they fought according to Vedic principles. The Brahmins and Kshatriyas were all satisfied by King Gaya because of his proper administration. He satisfied the Kshatriya kings by his fighting and satisfied the Brahmanas by his charities. The Vaishyas were also encouraged by kind words and affectionate dealings. And due to Maharaj Gaya's constant sacrifices, the Sudras were satisfied by sumptuous food and charity. So you can see Maharaj Gaya understood the Vedic system and according to everyone's different positions, he satisfied them. Very nice, very important. And Prabhupada describes here how important it is to satisfy people when you satisfy the brahmanas and the saintly people, when they're honoured and they part, then they give, they give one-sixth of their pious activities. When people honour them and render them service, they're obliged to give them charity and they will give them, they will share their pious activities with them. So that's the benefit of serving the brahmanas or serving the devotees. Mahatsevam dwara mahorva muktes. It opens the doors to liberation. You get some of their pious activities. So it's described more about Maharaj Gaya, how even uh, Indra would come there to enjoy the intoxicant, the somaras there, which would be given to Maharaj Gaya. He could attract the demigods. Even Lord Vishnu, the Yagna Purush, also came and personally accepted the sacrifices offered unto him because of the devotion of Maharaj Gaya. And the, the text 13 describes when the, Lord, when the Lord, the personality of Godhead, the Yagna Purush came there, he came to the arena and said, I am fully pleased. So Maharaj Gaya had that power that he could give great pleasure to the Supreme Lord. So very nice description here of all the wonderful qualities of Maharaj Gaya. And how much leaders need to learn from the activity, from the qualities of such personalities. And then the rest of the chapter we hear about uh, the final descendant, Viraja. He was also another great devotee coming in the line of Maharaj Priyavrata. All right, so this is ta chapter 15 covered. Any questions on chapter 15 before we go on? Any comments or questions from anyone? No? Okay, then we will go ahead. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. What are the significance of uh, explaining about the descendants of uh, Priyavrata here, Maharaj Priyavrata, and then moving on towards the description of Jambudvipa? If we try to connect these two, is it that uh, the descendants where they were actually residing? in all the different parts of this uh, uh, places such as Jambu Dvipa and the other kind of Dvipa. So is that kind of a pre rule that we can understand what kind of a uh, connection that we have between these two chapters? Well, what I understand, what I understand from Srila Prabhupada's purport was that earlier, at the beginning of this uh, fifth canto, we heard about Maharaj Priyavrata. And we heard how he had, uh, by driving his chariot behind the chariot of the sun god, the 
wheels of his chariot had made ditches and these ditches caused island, the islands in Bhumandala. So Maharaj Parikshit asked for descriptions, more detailed descriptions of these islands because he felt Sukadeva Goswami had described it only very briefly and he wanted to hear more about it. Now one commentator, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he describes that Maharaj Parikshit asked this question, he asked it for the description of Jambadweep. It said, he, he says it wasn't for himself, but he said it was because there was a class of people in the audience who are Yoga Mishra, or Bhakti Yoga Mishra. Bhakti Mishra yogis. Bhakti, mi Bhakti Mishra yogis. They were yogis mixed with devotion. And they were, they were there when Sukadeva Goswami was speaking Srimad Bhagavatam. And for their purpose, he wanted Sukadeva Goswami to just give more information about the Jambu Dweep. Uh, Thank you, Maharaj. We'll, we'll discuss that more as we go through the chapter. It's a, an important point to understand that uh, Maharaj Parikshit, of course, he's about he's only got some few days left to live. So we would think that with the few days left to live, that he would be eager to hear more about the confidential pastimes of Lord Krishna. But it seems like almost like just the opposite, that he wants to know about this special form of the Lord, you know, this uh, something like the, the universal form, the form of the Lord which is all-pervading, and which is not material, and which is sato. So Sukadeva Goswami, he'd already described earlier in the second canto, in the second canto where he began preaching to Maharaj Parikshit, he talked about the, the universe as the form of the Lord. So Maharaj Parikshit, understands that everything is the Lord. Because Maharaj Parikshit, remember, as a embryo in the womb of Uttara, he had been saved by the Lord, and he had seen the Lord while he was still in the mother's womb. So he is, uh, he's really Parikshit, he's Vishnu Ratha as well. And so he has that nature to see the Lord. He's always looking for the Lord and seeing the Lord everywhere and everything. So when he thinks of the universe, he doesn't think of it as just something material, but he thinks of it in relation to the Lord. It's the form of the Lord for him. For someone on the level of Maharaj Parikshit, there's nothing separate from Krishna. Everything is spiritual for him. Everything is the energy of the Lord. So everything is spiritual. So he doesn't see any difficulties in hearing about Jambu Dweep. And therefore he asks, you see he asks this question to Maharaj Parikshit. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's see here this chapter, this interesting chapter on Jambu Dwi. So it be begins with Maharaj Parikshit. He has two questions actually. Maharaj Parikshit said, text number one, O Brahmana, you have already informed me that the radius of Bhumandala extends as far as the sun spreads its light and heat and as far as the moon and all the stars can be seen. 
So this is the size of Bhumandala. We're told this is the, the Lent, or the Prabhupada talks about the radius, the difference, the distance between the sun and the earth planet, 93 million miles. So he said 93 million miles can be considered the radius of Bhumandala. So Bhumandala, Prabhupada also quotes, it's also referred to in the Gayatri Mantra, Bhur, Bhumandala. It's in the center of the universe. At the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, Sukadeva Goswami explained the lo location of the planets and this indicates that the information was known long, long before Sukadeva Goswami related it to Maharaj Parikshit. The location of the various planetary systems were not unknown to the sages who flourished in the Vedic age. So, we understand that this information is, we could say like the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita, practically it's perennial knowledge, eternal knowledge. Five thousand years ago it was certainly there, and how long it had been there, how long this knowledge had been there, we don't actually know. But it's, it's not new knowledge. Sukadeva Goswami heard it. He knew it. Where did he get it from? Well, he heard from Srila Vyasadeva, his own father. Srila Vyasadeva must have known. Where did Srila Vyasadeva get it from? He must have heard it from his father, Parasharamuni. Maybe Parasharamuni told him. And then like this, parampara, from the parampara, this knowledge is coming down. That is the point. We don't want to look to scientific evidence and scientific knowledge will simply confuse our minds. We want to hear from the Vedic authority. We know so many things about the scientific theories and scientific research. So many times they've been proved wrong, different theories, different changes, oh this was not right. You know, they had the corpuscular theory and then the atomic theory and then the wave theory and then the quantum theory, one after another. Just theories. to try to explain different phenomena. But if we hear from Sukadeva Goswami, then we're getting the absolute truth. And Prabhupada talks about how scientists regard, sometimes they think of stars, they say they're like, the, they're like suns. But Prabhupada explains they're not suns, that the stars simply reflect the sunshine just as the moon also reflects the sunshine. So these are different uh, differences of opinion between modern science and the Vedic theory. So Sukh, Sukh, and Maharaj Parikshit is speaking, addressing Sukadev Goswami, and then he talks about Maharaj Priyavrata's chariot which was described earlier in this canto, and how his chariot had created the seven oceans. And because of him, the Bo Mandala is divided into seven islands. But he said, you have given a very general description of their measurement, names and characteristics. Now I wish to know of them in detail. Kindly fulfill my desire. So, 
So this is Maharaj Pariksit's question. He wants to hear about this. The seven oceans and the seven islands, which were the result of Priyavrata's riding his chariot. Not an ordinary chariot ride, right? Priyavrata, such a, an amazing, incredible personality. No one can follow his example. No one can imitate him. Going ahead, text number three, we will hear. When the mind is fixed upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his external feature, made of the material modes of nature, the gross universal form, it is brought to the platform of transcendent, platform of pure goodness, the transcendental position, one can understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Maharaj Parikshit goes on, Vasudeva, who is in his subtler form, is self-effulgent and beyond the modes of nature. O oh my Lord, please describe vividly how that form which covers the entire universe is perceived. So this is Maharaj Pariksha's question. You can see the second question. Describe vividly how that form which covers the universe, the entire universe, is perceived. So we're going to, just like the universal form, this universal form is material, but it's a form of the Lord. It's covering the, the whole universe. It's, everything in the universe is there within the universal form. So Maharaj Parikshit wants to hear about this particular form. So Prabhupada explains, everything is the energy of the Lord, so nothing is material. And he quotes Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati and he quotes Rupa Goswami and the importance that everything which is used in Krishna's service is actually spiritual. So we don't give up anything which is connected with Krishna. So as I said, Maharaj Parikshit, he has this consciousness. Prabhupada writes, when Maharaj Parikshit was thinking of the universal form of the Lord, his mind was certainly situated on the transcendental platform. Therefore, although he might not have had any reason to be concerned with detailed information of the universe. He was thinking of it in relationship with the Supreme Lord. And therefore, such ge geographical knowledge was not material, but transcendental. We have to be very careful how we view this section of the Bhagavatam. We may be thinking of it in a very mundane way, very material conceptions. We're trying to understand the geography of the universe. But Prabhupada makes the point, Maharaj Parikshit is not concerned with geographical knowledge. And Prabhupada also brings this point out in several purports in this chapter, that we have to go, we have to go through the material reality to come to the spiritual reality. Our goal is to come to the spiritual reality, not to just get lost in this material reality, the, this knowledge, the geography of the universe. We have to go through this knowledge of the universe, to come to the spiritual reality. That's the real point. So, 
Sometimes people get, you know, very much into the, the geography of the universe, which is Sukadeva Goswami himself will admit his limitations in describing the geography of the universe. Is it, it's impossible to know everything about the universe. It's impossible. Although it's a material universe, it's unlimited. And nobody can know. He said, even if you live for a lifetime of Brahma, you won't know everything about the universe. Look at this planet Earth. There are so many places we still don't know about. There are so many parts of the world which are unexplored, which we're not able to understand. There's so many different phenomena, places in existence. We don't know well, how it got there, what happened, how it came about. We're very limited in our knowledge. But what we do have to do, we have to hear. We have to hear through the parampara. So that is the important point. So at the end of the purport, uh, Prabhupada writes there, Therefore, although Parikshit Maharaj had no need for geographical knowledge of this universe, that knowledge was also spiritual and transcendental because he was thinking of the entire universe as an expansion of the energy of the Lord. So that's a very important point to understand when we think of the universe, to think of this universe as the energy, the external energy of the Lord. And by hearing this description of Jambadweep, we should become impressed about the the unlimited nature of the Lord's external energy, that his external potency is so inconceivably great. And we should just be overwhelmed at understanding. And this should give us great impetus to want to surrender fully to the Lord and to enter into his confidential service. Now, hearing about the external energy, as we said, the external, the material world represents simply one-fourth of his potency. So we cannot understand one-fourth of the spiritual, of the, of the potency of the Lord, this external potency. We will never be able to understand the spiritual potency of the Lord. We'll never be able to understand it with our own limited mind and senses. But he can reveal it to us according to our qualification. Lord Krishna says, To those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. So Lord, our process is, Everything is revealed. It's process of knowledge is descending. We're not following the. We're not speculators or gyanis that everything comes the ascending way, the hard way. That's not our process. Our process is descending. The knowledge comes down. We have to hear through the parampara. And from these purports of Srila Prabhupada and the speaking of Sukadeva Goswami, then we try to understand whatever we can understand, we can know something of the greatness of the Lord. Prabhupada quotes a, a nice verse from Srimad Bhagavatam there in the purport Idamhi Vishwam Bhagavan Ivetaraha. Right? Narada Muni was instructing Srila Vyasadeva hmm, that the entire universe is also the personality of Godhead. There's nothing separate from the Lord. Uh, Prabhupada gives the example how the leaves and the branches of the tree are also part of the tree. 
we could say, we could refer to them as a tree. But leaves and branches on their own are not a tree. And just like our arms and legs are part of our body. But if the arm and leg is disconnected from the body, it's not a body anymore. So long as they're connected to the body, they're part of the body. It's the body. But as soon as you disconnect, if you amputate an arm or leg, it's no longer part of the body. In the same way, everything is Krishna's energy. But if you disconnect it from Krishna, then that creates a problem. It has to be, we have to see the connection between the material world, this, this form, this universal form which is being described, this form of the Lord in the universe, and the Lord Himself. That is His energy. We have to see it in relation to Krishna. Then it's a value. If it's disconnected from Krishna, then it's not spiritual anymore. Of course, nothing can be disconnected from Krishna, but the, the, the materialists, they try to do that. They want to separate everything from Krishna. All right? So Prabhupada, this, this uh, text number, number three is an important point here. Prabhupada makes this point about sometimes we think that uh, we're doing different services for the Krishna Consciousness Movement and we may think it to be material. Or you think, oh, I have to go and see the, I have to go and see the government, I have to get permission for this festival or this program, or oh, I have to go and deal with this, you know, different issues. And Prabhupada even talks about his own self. Prabhupada would take and do banking and he would be concerned about printing, and how many copies of the books to be printed, and how they should be distributed, and what price the book. So many different details, it seems mundane, doesn't seem very spiritual. But Prabhupada said it's highly spiritual, because it's all in relation to Lord Krishna. There's no difference between Krishna's service and Lord Krishna. In the 1970s, the devotees were struggling very hard to open, to establish themselves in Juhu. You know, maybe you've read by now, even Kiriraj Prabh Maharaj has published his book about the building of the Juhu temple and the great struggle which the devotees underwent. The person who was owning the land was trying to sell it or Chit Prabhupada trying to take the money and keep the land. But Prabhupada outsmarted him. And, and so then there were there's problems with the municipality because the man who had sold the land to Prabhupada, he had connections with the municipality. And so the devotee in charge, Tamal Krishna Goswami at that time, he was constantly having to go to the municipal offices and talk to the people there and learn all the different regulations about putting up a building because it was a swamp land and they wanted to build a temple. So they had to know many of all the different regulations which were required. So Tamal Krishna Goswami was saying to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, he said, I know more about the Bombay municipality rules and regulations than I know about your books. But Prabhupada said, this is your service for Krishna. He said, you just do this service for Krishna and Krishna will take you back to Godhead. Just like Prabhupada told Swarup Damodar Maharaj, he told him, you preach to the scientists that life comes from life. Life doesn't come from matter. He said, and in this way Krishna will reveal your rasa with him. Because he was saying to Prabhupada, he wanted to meditate on rasa lila and he wanted to know more his rasa with Krishna. 
But Prabhupada said, you preach to these scientists that life comes from life, life doesn't, doesn't come from chemical, Krishna will reveal it to you. So Prabhupada was very uh, pushy in these, those days. Of course, he had to establish the basis for the Krishna consciousness movement. The Bombay temple was an important base for our, the beginning of our movement in India. Now so many centers are there all around India. But in Prabhupada's time, there was nothing. So it was great sacrifices which devotees had to make. There, were, there was no time to just sit down and read and chant. It was all work and go out <laughs> and collect money, get money, make life members. And Prabhupada would encourage. He wanted it. So, but it's, Prabhupada said, it's not material, that is spiritual. And I see, I can see the results, that the people who did all that service in those days, that they're very strong devotees even now, because they did so much sacrifice in the beginning. Just like there's one lady, her name is Daiva Shakti, Prabhupada disciple, and she used to distribute books in New York City in a place called Port Authority Terminal. Port Authority Terminal is a bus terminal in the heart of New York City. And there's a subway in the basement there. So the subway comes in and there's buses all over America go out from the bus terminal. And she would be there all day, from early in the morning to late at night, distributing books. And she did a lot of preaching, she made wonderful devotees, she brought people like Devamrita Swami into Krishna consciousness, she met him there in Port Authority. And after some years, she did that for some years, then she came to India and she stayed in Vrindavan and she took up service there and she's still there, serving Krishna there. And there are many other examples, many wonderful devotees like that. They did so much work distributing Prabhupada's books or doing fundraising for Prabhupada, making life members, that because of that they, they got special credits from Krishna, that they're still in Krishna consciousness even today. So it's important, you know, you do some service for Krishna, Krishna will take care of the devotees. You give the mercy, you get a lot of mercy yourself. So Prabhupada writes that one is absorbed in thoughts of such management does not mean that he is outside of Krishna consciousness. So <laughs> management is a, can be a, it can be a great headache, very difficult, but somebody has to do it, somebody has to be in charge. Prabhupada knew that and he made sure he got the most qualified devotees to do it. And he appreciated them for doing it. He gave them credit, he gave them more recognition because they're taking on that responsibility, the management, all the headaches, hearing all the problems and dealing with all the complaints and all of this stuff. This is management, not easy, very difficult work. So we have to be very appreciative for devotees who do this, who are, who are taking that, that service on, because it's such a task, such a burden to be a manager. Uh, and I know in the Gulf there, like Sri Balabha Prabhu, you know, he can get called any time, day and night. Somebody. Recently, one, one young girl I know, one young devotee, she was in Europe and she was coming back to India and somehow she got stuck in Dubai and she couldn't go because she didn't have a proper document. And she was there in Dubai, and where to go? They wouldn't let her go to India without this document. And it was a big crisis. So in the middle of the night, somehow they contacted Sri Balabha Prabhu, and he, he, he was kind enough to take care of her 
and then he arranged everything to get her through. So these kind of things go on all the time. Every week there will be some problem like this. This is management. But Prabhupada said this is not material. He said that is Krishna consciousness. Okay, so Sukadeva Goswami begins his reply in text number four and he describes no, there is no limit to the expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead's material energy. His material energy has, is infinite, it's unlimited. This material world is a transformation of the material qualities, three modes of nature. Yet no one could possibly explain it perfectly even in a lifetime as long as that of Brahma. No one in the material world is perfect, and an imperfect person could not describe the material universe accurately, even after continued speculation. So, nobody is perfect, certainly we know that. No, every, nobody's perfect. Every, Everyone makes mistakes. To err is human, right? We see. So no one is perfect. So how to describe the material universe accurately? Just we, therefore, we just simply have to hear. We have to hear what the parampara tells us. Sukadeva Goswami says, therefore, he said, I shall nevertheless try to explain to you the principal regions, such as Bhu Loka or Bhuga Loka, with their names, forms, measurements, and various symptoms. All right. So, this is Sukadeva Goswami beginning, warning us that what can we we, we can't present much about it, but to, whatever we know, we're willing to say. Then at the end of this purport, Prabhupada writes about tiny scientists whose senses and instruments are all imperfect and who cannot give us information of even the one universe. We should therefore be satisfied with the information obtained from Vedic sources as spoken by authorities like Sukadeva Goswami. Certainly, why put your faith in scientific knowledge? What do they have to offer to us? So Sukadeva Goswami describes about Bhumandala and he gives an example. He compares it to the lotus flower and has seven islands resembling the world of the lotus flower. And the length and breadth of that island, known as Jambudweep, which is situated in the middle of the world, are one million yojanas, eight million miles. Jambudweep is round like the leaf of a lotus flower. So, just an, giving an example, comparing Jambudweep. So Jambudweep is like the leaf of a lotus flower, Bhumandala resembles a lotus flower, the seven islands like the world. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? Is it appropriate if I can interrupt you? Okay. Uh, Maharaj, the Bhumandala which is referring here is resembling like a lotus. Uh, and the Jambudvipa, which is referring here as uh, like a leaf of a lotus flower. So the leaf of a lotus flower is, uh, it's like a plain structure. It's like a, it's, it's like it has only a two dimension, in fact, to say. It's like a flat surface. And uh, so, but what we understand uh, about the uh, planetary systems, they're all spherical in, in, in the modern days uh, concept. So these two things appear to be a little different in its uh, our descriptions. So how do we try to uh, reconcile this, Maharaj? Well, when we go on Navadvip Parikrama, when we go on Navadvip 
Mandalparigrama, we also describe that the dweeps there are like petals of the lotus. Yes. Uh, right? Yeah. So, the point is that it appears flat when you're in that particular place. So, to think of it as round, spherical, that's something. Anyway, when, as we continue, we'll come, you know, this is another point, you're bringing up whether or not spherical, is it spherical or is it flat? The example is given anyway, that it resembles, it's just a similar, it's not exactly like that, but it's just giving a comparison to help us to understand something of the, how they're connected to each other. Not that they have to be on, on one plane, but they could also be with some depth also. It's difficult to know more about it at this point. We just have to work with the information we're given, resembling the whirl of that flower. Right? Seven islands resembling the whirl of that flower. And so then, in the middle of the whirl are Jambu, in the middle of the world are one million yojanas. Jambu dweep is round like the leaf of the lotus flower. So round, yeah, different. The the the, lo, the leaves of the petals of the lotus flower certainly they're round. We're not sure if they're talking about the petal, they say the leaf of a lotus flower. Is it a petal? We'd have to look at the Sanskrit. Patram. Pushkara patram. A lotus leaf. Patram, a leaf, yeah. Okay, we'll come back to that. We'll put that question in the car park. We'll come back to it later on. Let's see if we get some more. As we go through this section of the Vedic Planetarium, we'll find out if we get some more information on whether or not it's spherical or flat. British. Text number six. Jambudweep, nine divisions of land. And we're given the dimensions that eight mountains that mark the boundaries of these divisions and separate them nicely. The, it's customary to have mountains along the boundary. We see different countries also, their boundaries are often made by mountains. So here also, it's a very culture, you can see the boundaries between different farshas is by mountains, location of the various mountains. Vishwanath Chakravarti gives the following quotation from Vayu Purana, wherein the location of the various mountains, beginning with the Himalayas, are described. We're not giving any commentary on that. We'll go ahead. Amongst these divisions or varshas is the varsha named Ilavrita, which is situated in the middle of the whirl of the, of the lotus. Within Ilavrita Varsh is Sumeru Mountain, which is made of gold. Sumeru Mountain is like the pericarp of the lotus-like lotus Bhumandala planetary system. The mountain's height is the same as the width of Jambudweep, or in other words, 100,000 yojanas. Of that, 16,000 yojanas are within the earth, and therefore the mountain's height above the earth is 84,000 yojanas. The mountain's width is 32,000 yojanas, and its summit, and it at its summit and 16,000 yojanas at its base. 
So it's mentioned that part of the mountain is under the earth, so flat. It, it may still be flat with some depth, or it may be spherical, we don't know. Let's see. But there's a reference there. Right? The mountain's height. And part of it is below the earth. Alright, then we get more information. North of Ilavrita Varsha, going further, mark the boundaries of the three Varshas, the width of the mountain, then going from south to north, the length of each mountain is one tenth that of the previous mountain, but the height of them all is the same. In the purport, Prabhupada quotes Madhvacharya, it appears from these verses of, which are given by Madhvacharya that aside from the sun and moon there is an invisible planet called Rahu. The movement of Rahu causes both solar and lunar eclipses. We suggest that the modern expeditions attempting to reach the moon are mistakenly going to Rahu. So in Prabhupada's time, of course, it was controversial that they claimed Americans had gone to the moon and Prabhupada said, nonsense, it wasn't the moon. And Prabhupada said, probably they went to Rahu. So he brings it up in his purport here in this section of the Bhagavatam. There's some reference here to the invisible planet the eclipses of the sun and the moon caused by Rahu. That will come up later. We'll hear more about the eclipses. So Ilavritavarsh, south of Ilavritavarsh and extending from east to west are three great mountains and then each of them is 10,000 yojanas high. They mark the boundaries of the three varshas named Hari Varsha, Kimpurusha Varsha, and Bharat Varsha, India. In the same way, west and east of Ilavrita Varsha are two great mountains named Malayavan and Ganga Madana, respectively. These two mountains, which are 2,000 yojanas high, extend as far as Nila mountain in the north and Nishida in the south. They indicate the boundaries of Ilavrita Varsh and also the Varshas known as Ketumala and Badrashva. And then Prabhupada talks about mountains and Prabhupada says he thinks that Actually, today people don't really know the height of mountains and he said they haven't measured them accurately. They don't really understand what is the size of these mountains. And Prabhupada talks about South America, that he saw mountains there in South America. He said they were so big, he said, definitely, he said, they didn't really know how to measure the size of these mountains. So Prabhupada continues to talk on the same theme about hearing from authorities. We should simply be satisfied with the statements of authorities like Sukadeva Goswami and appreciate how the entire cosmic manifestation has been made possible by the external energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Our experimental knowledge can neither verify nor disprove the statements of Srimad Bhagavatam. We should simply hear these statements from the authorities. If we can appreciate 
the extensive energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead that will benefit us. So we have to hear about Krishna's energy, that's important for us. Understand these are all descriptions of the energy of the Lord, the external energy. Text number 11 goes on. The four sides of the great mountain known as Meru are four mountains. Mandara, Meru Mandara, Suparshva and Kumuda, which are all like its belts. The length and height of these mountains are calculated to be 10,000 yojanas. Standing like flagstaffs on the summits of these four mountains are a mango tree, a rose apple tree, a kadamba tree and a banyan tree. These trees are calculated to be a width of 100 yojanas and a height of 1,100 yojanas. Their branches also spread to a radius of 1,100 yojanas. So the descriptions are becoming very interesting. We're hearing now these mountains and top of each mountain there's a tree like a flagstaff. And one mountain has a mango tree on top, the other mountain has a rose apple tree, the other mountain has a kadamba tree and then one with a bunyan tree. And then text 11, uh, 13 to 14 goes on, we hear about between the four mountains and the four huge, there are four mountains and four huge lakes and the water of the first tastes like milk, the water of the second like honey, and that of the third like sugarcane juice, and the fourth is filled with pure water. The celestial beings, different demigods, they come there to enjoy the facilities of these four lakes. Consequently, they have perfection of mystic yoga and different yoga powers are described by Prabhupada. Four, so then, then mentioned there are four gardens there also where people go to enjoy. The demigods along with their wives who are like ornaments of heavenly beauty meet together and enjoy within these gardens. So these are demigods, they're not eternally there, they're enjoying for some time, but they also have to worry about death. Text 16 continues, on the lower slopes of Mandara mountain is a mango tree named Deva Chuta. It is 1,100 yojanas high, mangoes as big as mountain peaks and as sweet as nectar fall from the top of the tree for the enjoyment of the denizens of heaven. So then we hear what happens when the fruit falls, how they make a river and, and people enjoy that nectar. The juice cascades like a waterfall down the mountain. And it makes a beautiful aroma, everyone enjoys the aroma. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, I got just a small question. This, like uh, we are discussing the Bhu Mandal, everything, what we are mountain and all are Bhu Mandal. And we see here that the uh, demigods or denizens of the heaven, they enjoy the fruits. Yes. So how did... How what? How do we understand from the like denizen and demigods are on the heavenly planet like upper planets, right? Yes. And but, this is the description of the Bhumloka. So, so they come down to have these fruits or how do we... Yeah, the, yeah the, 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 demigod, the demigods often come to Meru mountain to enjoy. Okay. They come to these different... they know where to enjoy. Just like, you know, people on this planet, we also know where to go to enjoy, right? Where do you go when you want to enjoy? 
you know, in India, they will, where you go, you know, you go up to Dehradun or something in the very hot season, you know, let's go to Dehradun, you know, somewhere up the mountains a bit cool down. So demigods also, they will come to, you know, Mount Meru, and we heard there's gardens there, and you've got these wonderful, you know, you, to go to these places you have to be very pious. So the demigods, they can do it, you know, not everybody can do it. But certain demigods, certain, they can do it. Okay, demigods, the upper demigods, there's t different levels of demigods. You've got the, you know, we'll hear at the end of this chapter, there's Brahma. Brahma's got his residence and then around Brahma there's the eight principal demigods and they've got their residences around Brahma. And Brahma's up on Mount Meru, on the summit of Mount Meru and the demigods are around there like Indra and Agni and they're living up there. And then other demigods are coming like Gandharvas and these different people, they come there to enjoy this mango nectar. And even we hear the pious wives, text number 18, the pious wives of the Yakshas. Now the Yakshas, they're also, you know, they're a bit higher than us, you know. They, They've got mystic powers, many of them. And some in the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada said something. He said some people say the Yakshas are the Tibetans. I don't know if the Tibetans are Yakshas, but anyway, that's what Prabhupada put there in the Bhagavatam. So the pious wives of the Yakshas act as personal maidservants to assist Bhavani, the wife of Lord Shiva, because they drink the water of the river. Arunoda, their bodies become fragrant, and as the air carries away that fragrance, it perfumes the entire atmosphere for 80 miles around. Oh, that is no ordinary perfume, huh? 80 miles carries the fragrance. And then the jumbo tree is described, and these fruits are the size of elephants, and the juice sliding down makes a river. It floods the entire land with that juice. <laughs> so, it's inconceivable to our limited intelligence to understand these things. It appears almost like mythology, fairy tales, and continuing further, we'll hear about the mud on both sides of the river where the jambu nadi, the jambu fruit juice makes an, a river and the banks on either side become like gold, huge quantities of gold. The, the, the flowing juice dried by the air and the sunshine produces huge quantities of gold called Jambu Nada. And so they have so much gold. Everyone's decorated, their bodies are all covered with gold. So that makes them also happy. They feel good, you know, if you wear all your gold, if you have a lot of gold and you decorate yourself with it, they, this way they enjoy life. Bangles, helmets and belts, all of gold. So this is enjoyment for people. So we're struggling, we're, we're poor, we're thinking we're rich, you know, you have a little gold, you have a little gold ornament, but these people have so much gold. They're more pious though, they're not inhabitants of earth, they're more pious than we are. Prabhupada talks about women, they said they wear plastic nowadays and gold plating, everything is gold plated. But people, had, it was just pure gold. So some people, Prabhupada explains, some people want to go to the heavenly planets to enjoy but pure devotees are not at all interested in such, such opulence. 
For devotees, this gold is like the color of stool. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has told devotees not to be attracted by gold. Nadanam, Najanam, Nasundarim. Right? We want devotional service. Mama Janmani, Janmanishwari. Right? Give me devotional service, birth after birth. That is the real desire of the devotee. So. Maharaja. Yes. I just have it, uh, I mean, I just wanted one clarification. Uh -huh. uh, we always hear wherever there is a gold, there is the effect of the Kali. In those places, uh, we will not uh, have any effect of Kali there. Well, the effect of Kali will come with this hoarding of gold. If you have the hoarding of gold, people are hoarding, they're keeping it, they're collecting it and want to get more and more. And they're thinking, this is mine. But you see, these people, they had so much gold, no, people didn't think anything of it because everybody else had gold, everybody had gold. And it was, it was there, it was just along the bank of the river, it was all gold. And we heard Mount Meru is gold, gold mountain. And so people were not so much bewildered by gold like we are. We become degraded by the top thinking, becoming conscious about gold. We're thinking it's for our enjoyment. And so it's not that there's anything wrong with gold, but it's the consciousness with which we have it. Is it for our own sense gratification, for our own enjoyment, or is it for Krishna's service? Hmm? Gold, we are saying it all belongs to Krishna, it's Krishna's energy. So these people in these higher regions, they're not on the earthly planet, they're in higher regions, they're, they have more consciousness of the Supreme Lord, they remember the Lord. So they see the gold, they're not thinking, it's just for me, but they understand it all belongs to the Supreme Lord, it's His gold. And they may wear it, they may wear it on their bodies for His pleasure. So the consciousness is very important. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Bhogaisvarya pratsaptanam thaya parachachetasam. In the minds of those who are attached to material opulence and sense gratification and who are bewildered by such things, the resolute determination for devotional service does not take place. And you can see here, at the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, a devotee is never allured by such opulence. He simply aspires to become the dust of the lotus feet of the Lord. Right? That's a devotee. So we shouldn't get bewildered by gold. So these people, these people in the higher regions of the universe, they're not bewildered by the gold. Okay, continuing, we hear about on one side of Suparshva mountain, stands a big tree called Mahakadamba, which is very celebrated. And from the hollows of this tree flow five rivers of honey. <laughs> so honey, Prabhupada, we get honey from the forests, but today people are cutting all the trees. So the flowing honey flow, falls incessantly from the top of Suparshva mountain and flows all around Ilavrita Varsh. Just imagine a river of honey, the air carrying the scent from the mouths of those who drink that honey perfumes the land for a hundred yojanas around. Must be very intoxicating honey. Continuing, 
text number uh, 24. Similarly, on Komuna mountain, there's a great banyan tree, which is called Shatavalsa, because it had a hundred main branches. And from these branches come many roots, from which many rivers are flowing. And these rivers flow down around Gilavratavars for the benefit of those who live there. Because of these flowing rivers, all the people have ample supplies of milk, yogurt, honey, clarified butter, molasses, food grains, clothes, bedding, sitting places and ornaments. All the objects they desire are sufficiently supplied for their prosperity and therefore they're very happy. So this is happiness. What is happiness? You know, what is our happiness? What, what do we do for happiness? In the Chaitanya Bhagavat, there's a pastime. Lord Chaitanya was coming with Lord Nityananda. They were on their way to Shantipur to see Advaita Acharya. And they passed this home. Oh, there was this one sannyasi there. And the sannyasi saw Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda and he was friendly with them. And the sannyasi said to them, you want to come to my place and drink some happiness? You want some happiness? He asked Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. And Lord Chaitanya looked at Lord Nityananda and said, what does he mean? And Lord Nityananda said, he's asking us if we want to drink some alcohol with him. So when Lord Chaitanya heard it, he ran and threw himself in the Ganga. And Lord Nityananda followed behind. He also threw himself in the Ganga. And they swam all the way down to Shantipur. So you get people, this kind of sannyasi, he was a sannyasi, in sannyasi dress, living with a woman, and he was saying, come and drink some, I'll give you some, let's have some happiness together. He was wanting them to drink alcohol. So what is happiness? For some people they think like that, intoxication. But what is actual happiness? The products of nature are real and actually they give happiness. The products of nature are sufficient, Prabhupada says. And how do we get these products of nature? Prabhupada said, the performance of sacrifice. Yagya, what is the yagya? Well, chanting the holy name, of course that's there. But we have to also work. We have to do agriculture, cow protection, these things, this, this will bring the, the gifts of nature. We don't need big factories, we don't need industry, we don't need gigantic skyscrapers, big automobiles rushing down the highways. Products of nature are sufficient. We can see the modern world didn't make people happy. Just because country becomes more, you build highways and you have big airports, doesn't mean people are happier. It means they're more in anxiety, they're more depressed. So Sukadeva Goswami describes about people who are living in these places, he said, the residents of the material world who enjoy the products of these flowing rivers have no wrinkles on their bodies and no grey hair. Wow, hear that. No wrinkles on their bodies and no grey hair. So wonderful. They never feel fatigue. And perspiration does not give their bodies a bad odour. They're not affected by old age, disease or untimely death. They still die, but not untimely. So old age, disease, 
these things, this is all on this planet, on this planet Earth, we have all these horrible things. Smelly bodies, wrinkled, fit, wrinkled skin, grey hair, if you have any hair at all, it's grey. But these people, they live very happily, without anxiety, until death. Of course, they also have to die. That's there for everyone. Therefore, we have to perfect the life. Not just think about enjoying the material world. We should think how to get out of this world. That is the real goal. And this is what Srimad Bhagavatam is all about. It's taking us through all of this geography of the material world so that we can go beyond the material world, into the spiritual world. So Prabhupada talks about the perfection of human society. What do you have to do? <laughs> Prabhupada's purport is very wonderful. He says, how can the people be happy? They must suffer from all the misery of materialism. Their bodies become wrinkled and gradually deteriorate and they become like dwarfs and the bodies smell because unclean perspiration resulting from eating all kinds of nasty things. This is not human civilization. If people actually want happiness in this life, then they must adopt a Vedic civilization. In Vedic civilization, full supply of all the necessities, everything is provided in the Vedic culture. So, this is important to be convinced about. We're thinking, we have everything, we're thinking, I'm comfortable, I'm living very nicely. The people in the higher planets in these regions, they would be disgusted to see the way we live, to see the, how the conditions and the, the level in which we're living. They would be shocked, they would think, oh, how horrible. They feel so compassionate, they feel sorry for us. We may be thinking, I'm living very nicely, very opulent. It's just our ignorance. All right, then continues, other mountains beautifully arranged around the foot of Mount Meru, like the filaments around the whirl of a lotus flower. And we hear the names of these different mountains. And then on the eastern side of Mount Meru, there's also rivers or more mountains. We hear about the different size. Sumero, a mountain of solid gold, shining as brilliantly as fire, surrounded by those eight mountains. So you got Sumeru mountain and surrounded by eight mountains on different sides. One of them is Kailash. In the middle of Mount Sumeru is the township of Lord Brahma. Each of the four sides is calculated to extend 10 million yojanas. It is made entirely of gold. And therefore, learned scholars and sages call it Shatakumbi. Kumba. Kumbi. Hundred, hundred gold, made entirely of gold. And then around Brahmapuri, in all directions, are the residents of the eight principal governors of the planetary system, beginning with King Indra. All right, that's 
chapter 16, description of Jamba Dweep. Any more questions on this chapter? Maharaj? Yes. Uh, in Bhagavad Gita, Lord says, A Brahma Bhuvana Loka, right from the Brahma Loka down to the all material planets, it's a place of suffering. Hmm? How come we see here, you know, all this uh, 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 residents of this uh, uh, above planetary system, they are happy, Maharaj? They are, do not experience any wrinkles, they, they don't grow <laughs> cold, no perspiration, all this. How do we understand this, Maharaj? Yes, because there's also death there. Although there's no suffering, not su they still have to worry about death. They're not free of death. Lord Brahma also has to think about death. He's also thinking and you know that he knows he's got a hundred years to live. He knows the duration of his life. He knows when the time's coming when he's going to have to give up that body. So that's, that's there. Just like it said, they don't, they, they don't suffer untimely death. They're aware it's going to come. So that's the fact. That's the nature of life in the material world. So Lord Brahma, although they have everything, all comforts and everything, they can't keep it forever. You can't remain in that position forever. It's temporary. Lord Brahma, he's using up his pious activities. And when his piety is all exhausted, he'll come down to earth. This earth planet, is, this is the karma stan. This is a place where we're earning our karma, which will determine where we go, which way we go. And so it's like that. We can have... Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Sorry. Yes, Maharaj, I continue. We can have everything material, but you can't keep it for long. It's material, means... It's going to be temporary because death, with death you have to give up, ev leave everything behind. So it's very difficult. As a demigod, you can get very attached. You get very attached to enjoying. You don't want to give up. You want to keep everything forever. This is a problem, material life. You can't do it. We have to understand. You want to keep it forever, you have to go to the spiritual world. You have to get out of this material world and enter into the spiritual world. There you can get eternal life, eternal relationships. It, everything is eternal there, not here, not in this world. And so the demigods, they have that problem. So much opulence, they want to come down here to get, to get detached. It's a bit easier on this planet because it's not too heavenly and it's not too hellish. It's considered the best place to become Krishna conscious. Yes, Madhaji? Maharaj, this we are discussing about the Bhumandal and all the opulences. What we see here is like the planet of the demigod. So, um, like if this is the part of Bhumandal having the same opulence as the demigod, Well, yes, the demigods are certainly coming there, and they're there. The demigods are in Swarg, right? This is Bhumandala, and the, and, and the demigods are up in Swargaloka. But they come, some of the demigods, they come there to Bhumandala. They come, they do come there. So we, we generally, we hear that we, there are, like they, we, we are not having so much opulence, demigod planets are having more opulence. Oh, yeah. So here we see that even the earth has so much opulence, like Bhumandal also has all the opulence what the demigod had, some part of it. Yes, the demigods, they have, they have opulence. It's described like that in Brihad Bhagavatamrita, that as Gopkumar was going through the different places in the universe, they became gradually more and more opulent and he was surprised which each place, one after another, was more and more opulent. He was thinking, you know, it was already so opulent, but he went to the next place, it was even more opulent. 
And then even more opulent. You know, just like people may come, may be living in India, and they may go to Dubai, and they think, oh, Dubai, very opulent. But then somebody from Dubai, they go to America, and then they think, wow, oh, America, more opulent than Dubai. And then from America, they may go to Japan, they see Japan, oh, more opulent than America. And then, you know, like this, you know, there's, everything is relative. And so opulence is also relative. The demigods, it's opulent, certainly they have opulence. But there was, we're hearing also Bhumandala, there's also opulence there. Mm. Yeah, any other questions, comments, Prabhu? Last question, Maharaj. Uh -huh. uh, Maharaj, in the verse number 28, uh -huh. uh, in the middle of the summit of Meru is the township of Lord Brahma. Mm. Maharaj, this is uh, this is Brahma Loka, or it's uh, just a, a township of Brahma where he, you know, he comes and uh, he just, you know, like as a picnic spot, he come and stay. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I, I'm, I have difficulty myself to relate how this relates to Brahma Loka. I, I don't know exactly how this relates to Brahma Loka. We're told uh, this is Brahma's residence. You know, it might be that he has different residences, you know, just like Advaita Acharya, he has a residence in Shantipur, he has another residence in Mayapur. So maybe Brahma also has different residences, you know. He may have a residence here in Mount Meru, and he is also his Brahma Loka. It may be like that, different residence. Uh, I, I, I just can't, I don't know all the, all the details, but not told. I'll try to find out by next class, but I'll try to ask around if, I, if we can find anybody who can answer that question for me. It's certainly a, a good question. I'll make a note of it and we'll try to inquire more into it, let you know what's the relationship here with the Brahma residents, Brahma Puri and Brahma Loka, how they compare, if there's any, if they're the same or if there's some difference, what exactly is the relationship. It would be interesting to know that. So I'll try to check it out for you. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, there is one question, Maharaj, in the chat box. Uh -huh. uh, is this Mount Kailasha is the same as abode of Lord Shiva? Yes, well, it would appear to be. You know, is it is it, of course, nowadays people are going to Kailash, they say it's in China, it's a mountain in China. Some people go through the border there and they come there. And even some of our Chinese devotees went there and I think Govinda Maharaj also went up there one time with them. They went to this place that's supposed to be Kailash. So it's, there was a, a place here on this planet, but whether or not uh, this, this Kailash mentioned here, we would think this should, to be more supreme. Now in, in Brihad Bhagavad Amrita, they describe Kailash to be the place where, you go, where you're going through the impersonal Brahma Jyoti. On the way to the impersonal Brahman, you come to Kailash, enter into the spiritual sky. On the border of the spiritual sky, there's Kailash, between the material and spiritual world. But this Kailash here, mentioned here, we understand this to be a reference to Lord Shiva's abode, although it doesn't actually say Lord Shiva's abode, but that's my understanding, that this is the abode of Lord Shiva. 
And it also mentioned Ganga Madana mountain. Ganga Madana mountain was where Hanuman had gone to collect the herbs to bring back to cure Lakshman when he'd been struck with the astra of Ravan's son, Indrajit. So these mountains are very special places, certainly Lord Shiva and Kuvera, they reside there, they also like mountain places, you see. So the demigods, they have their residences, which particular mountain it is and where it is, well, here's one place we're told, that it's in Bhumandala somewhere there. We could go, if, if somebody has yoga powers, they can go there. But Lord Shiva comes here, he comes to Mayapur to hear Gora Bhagavat. Right? He came on his swan, we have the Hamsa Bahan. He got Brahma Swan to come and hear Gora Bhagavat. So, you want to go, if you go to Kailash, what would you do there? We can simply offer our obeisances to Lord Shiva and ask him to please bless us in our Krishna consciousness. But Lord Shiva, he would like us to keep up the preaching. He will say, why are you coming here to see me? Better you preach. Go and preach to all the fallen souls. Distribute Krishna consciousness. He would say, you're doing, you're doing the greatest service by doing that. So we don't need to go off to Kailash. But anyway, we understand it's, it's somewhere here. It's mentioned there, certainly. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, um, yes Maharaji. Humble obeisances at your lotus feet. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to share a screen which shows a little map of uh, uh, Jambudweep. Okay, please. Mataji, will you allow me to share? Yeah, how, how, share, how do, we, do I need to press something to let you share the screen, is it? I have... I know Prabhu, uh, Prabhu will, uh, do you go in? Uh, Tulsi Prabhu, are you there? Can you make me host, please? Uh, by mistake, Mataji, Tulsi Prabhu logged in and now then, you know, uh, he became the host. Uh, oh. Tulsi Prabhu? Yeah, okay, I'll make you host now. Hang on. Yeah, thank you, Prabhu. I can show a picture of uh, Jambudvi. Okay, yes. I'll go back one minute. Yes. Um, here is uh, this one. Sorry, where touch it's going. Yeah, I got it. So all the Varshas are divided like this and Mount Meru is uh, right in the center. And this is Kailash. Uh, where Lord Shiva, actually Brahma also, Brahma Loka is here on at the top of Meru. That's what it is uh, said in another picture. So uh, Brahma Loka is part of this Jambudvipa, that's what it's written there. And uh, these are the seven Varshas with uh, Priyavartha's uh, uh, chariot, the seven lines forms. And uh, actually the Bharat Varsha is an uh, Mataji, the yes. seven varshas or the seven dvipas, and this is Jambu, this in totality is Jambu dvipa. 
this is the Chambu Dvipa is divided into nine sections because uh, if I'm right, if we read ahead, uh, Maharaja Priyavarta had many like many sons, and out of them he had divided seven. Uh, he had divided Bhulo, Bhumandala into seven parts for uh, one of each of his seven sons, and then Jambu Dvipa was given for his seventh son, and then he divided it further. Uh, into nine sections. So, I don't think. I guess that was my clarification on that point. I can I can only I can only see six lines going across, Jumbo. I mean I mean okay so if, if you see there's Kuru, Hiranma, Ramyaka, so that's on the north side. On the west side that's Ketumala. On the east side that's Bhadrasava, Bhadrasva. On the down sides, there's uh, where towards the Alakananda river, as Hari, Kimpurush, and Bharata. And each of these were divided uh, to, uh, by the sons of the uh, of one of the sons of Priyavarta. And then that's like that's how we see it. If that makes sense. Uh -oh. Okay, very nice, yes. Ma Maharaj, uh, with yes. your permission, uh -huh. uh, can we discuss in the next class, Maharaj? It's already... Uh, Late, yeah. yeah. And 20 for you, Maharaj, so we don't want to uh, hold you back. Okay. Uh, is it okay? Can we discuss in the next class, Maharaj? Okay, yeah, okay. thank you very much. Okay, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Yeah.